the scriptures say, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, the Bible says, rejoice. Many places the scriptures command, I mean, we take seriously what the Bible says, the scriptures command a joyful disposition towards God in all things at all times. Joy is a response to God. So make no mistake, what God says to you is his will for you if you are in Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus. His will for you, his command even, is that in all things, in all circumstances, in all situations, you rejoice. So what do you do when you cannot? What do you do when, as our church teaches, and I believe wholeheartedly, that we experience nothing in this life that has not passed through the fingers of a sovereign, providential God? What do you do when his word says to you, child of God, rejoice, and the circumstances he has permitted you to experience render it not possible. Let's be wise and just honest and think for a moment about all the kinds of circumstances and situations that we with even within our church and those we love have experienced that render a person unable to rejoice in the Lord. When your spouse dies, when your child dies, when your spouse comes to you and says, I don't love you anymore, when the voice on the other line of the phone says, the worst news you imagined about cancer, when your boss comes to you and says, today's your last day, when one that you love breaks your heart. Think of all of the circumstances God permits his children to experience that are absolutely gut-wrenching and leveling. And here I'm not talking just about what the chapel, some in the chapel are experiencing. I'm talking about the reality that all who are going to be mature in Jesus must come to terms with. God's desire for you and his command to you is to rejoice in all things. And yet, God sees fit for us to experience things in which you cannot rejoice. So what do you do? What do you do? What are some of the things you have found yourself moving towards in seasons like this? I think sometimes we turn inward. Some of us have a tendency to turn inward, and we begin to be silent towards God, and we begin to commiserate, to chew on all of these things around us, regardless of the cause of the darkness and the despair. Most often, as believers, it seems, we experience the natural consequences and then God's consequences of shooting ourselves in the foot. Probably the vast majority of heartache we experience is of our own doing because we do not believe as we ought to believe. We do not take the steps of faith we ought to take. But we also experience plenty of darkness from those around us, from those we love. The enemy is real and he delights in wreaking havoc in the lives of people. The ways of this world are fallen. We have our own flesh. Regardless of how we experience darkness and circumstances in which we cannot muster up praise to God, sometimes we turn inward. Some, maybe who are more extroverted in nature, turn outward to others. Sometimes we immediately move to others to either unburden ourselves or to rally people to us who will agree with our cause. You have the same fallen human nature I do. You have experienced these things. Sometimes we turn inward. Sometimes we turn outward. Sometimes we dredge up 
similar experiences of how we have been hurt or others have been hurt or how others have hurt us or disappointed us. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves vulnerable to begin to have hearts that get bitter or angry and move further and further away from God. Some, I think this is particularly common, some will just deny their pain. There is a way to deny your pain, which is obviously on the surface, not consistent with the ways of God. You can simply try to numb your pain. You can try to entertain yourself into numbness from your pain through alcohol, illicit sex, mindless entertainment. There's all kinds of ways we do that. But there is also a way that we minimize our pain that on the surface often seems noble and a little bit more Christian. It's to say, everything's okay. How are you doing? Fine. God is good. Yeah, I agree, God is good, but I asked you how you're doing. And the answer is, I'm doing lousy. My heart is broken. I'm hurt. I feel alone. I feel like a victim. I'm losing hope. I'm losing courage. I'm angry. I'm tired. I'm, I'm not doing well. But don't we sometimes say instead, I'm fine. And we force our mouths to sing words or speak words of praise that our heart is a mile from. Now, on the surface, that seems like a good way to go. I mean, there are worse ways to go. That seems like, isn't that what you should do? That when God has seen fit for you to experience circumstances in which you cannot praise Him at the moment, what you ought to do is just grit your teeth and say, God, be praised. I will praise Him anyway. I have good news for you. There is a better way. There is a way that God has sovereignly designed and communicated to his people, a way that the people of God have practiced from the earliest times, a way that is carved through forests of darkness into clearings of praise. This is lament. This morning, I want to consider a psalm of lament, Psalm 38. Join me in your Bibles if you brought one with you, and I encourage you to each week. There are 150 psalms. The psalms are the worship book, the hymnal if you're old school, the playlist if you're new school, of worship for Jesus and the first disciples. They have become our songbook. There's 150 of them. Do you realize more than one out of every three is a song of lament? David himself has penned over more than 40 of these. There are some 40 psalms that are individual, personal songs of lament. There are another 16 or 18, depending on how you count communal psalms of lament. Lament is the pathway through the dark forest into the clearings of praise. That you can, in any set of circumstances, in any situation, find yourself able in the Spirit to praise God when in your own flesh you would not be able to. There are four common elements to lament in Scripture. We're going to walk through Psalm 38, and I'll highlight these for you. These are not in all of the Psalms of lament. They're not linear. They're not always just step one, two, three, and four. I'm going to present them to you as steps one, two, three, and four to help you navigate seasons of darkness that God will, as he has in the past, permit you to experience for purposes that he accomplishes, frankly, that we would often rather he not. 
We often would rather God just give us an easy and a comfortable life. When God is interested in doing hard things, I find myself often rather unwilling. I would just rather have an easy road. But the Father is too good. He loves us too much to permit His Spirit in us to not give expression to God's character. So God will give you difficult things to experience, regardless of who caused it, regardless of why, whether you shot yourself in the foot or someone ran over your foot with their car. You will experience forests of darkness. Many of you have already. All of you will in the future. I promise you, as the word of God can be trusted, this is the path through the darkness to praise. If you walk this path in faith, you will be able to praise God in all things. There are four steps. You turn to God. You complain. Like, isn't that fun? You're so good at that already. You will need no counsel from me on how to complain. You've got that on lockdown. That's step two. Complain. Step three, ask boldly. And then step four, choose to trust him. Let's walk through this road. As we do, um, I don't want to neglect to credit. There's a pastor in Indianapolis. His name is Mark Vrogop. He has written a book. I believe it's called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, and then Something About Lamentation. Um, it is a helpful book. I have been instructed by articles that that man has written that form much of the content of what I'm going to share with you. I would commend that resource to you. Psalm 38, let me read it together to you and listen for these four themes, and then we will trace them out briefly together. Hear saints and guests, the word of the Lord. O oh, Yahweh, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. Oh, Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. In the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague, and my nearest kin stand far off. Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man. I do not hear. Like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Yahweh, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. For I said, only let them not rejoice over me, who boast against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. But my foes are vigorous. They are mighty. And many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good, Accuse me because I follow after good. Do not forsake me, O Yahweh. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. The first step in walking the road through the darkness to praise is to turn to God. We must resist our tendency to immediately turn inward, to stew on ourselves, to fill our minds with our own thoughts, 
our own connivings, our own worries, our own despair, our own plans of how we're going to fix this, of how we're going to bring justice, of how we're going to make this right. Do not turn inward. Do not turn first outward. How easy is it when you have been wronged to rally others to your side? as though the comfort of a friend who can tell you that's messed up, that shouldn't happen to you, is somehow better than what God alone can give. Turn to God. When you find yourself turning first to others and the Spirit says to you, don't make that phone call, don't send that message, don't, 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 then stop. And turn first to God. Don't look in. Don't look out. Look up to God. All of the psalm is a prayer to God. So he begins, oh, Yahweh, that's God's personal name. The whole psalm is offered to God. I know it is so much easier to turn inwardly or outwardly. It's easier to do that than to turn first to God. And we all have the same fallen nature and we all tend to travel the path that is easiest and not the path that is wise. We turn first to God. You have to turn to God. We resist the urge to deny our pain, whether in the explicitly unchristian ways And even I would suggest to you, you resist the urge to simply by your own effort say everything's okay. And you force your mouth to say things of praise that your heart does not actually believe in those moments. There is a better way. That is not the Christian response to just suck it up, to To just pull yourself up by the bootstraps and say, God, I'm gonna, I'm okay. Sometimes you're not. It takes faith to lament. Lamenting is not for those who do not believe that God is good. Because we believe he is good, we turn to him and we pour our hearts out to him. But turn to him first. He says in verse 17 and 18, I am ready to fall and my pain is ever before me. I mean, put those words in the mouth of a friend. And aren't you sometimes tempted to be like, what are you complaining for? Come on, look on the bright side. God is good. Come on, don't forget that. Don't we get nervous when people speak like this? When people around us paint in the darkest colors, when they're saying to us, I'm losing hope, I'm losing courage, that makes us nervous. We're like, no, no, don't, don't forsake God. And they're like, who's talking about forsaking God? I'm just telling you how terrible it is right now. God invites you to turn to him in the darkness. Turn to him first, we must. I want to read to you what one of the things Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, said about the Psalms of Lament. What is the greatest thing in the Psalter but this earnest speaking amid the storm winds of every kind? Where do you find deeper, more sorrowful, more pitiful words of sadness than in the Psalms of Lamentation? There again you look into the hearts of the saints as into death, yes, as into hell itself. When they speak of fear and hope, they use such words that no painter could so depict for your fear or hope, and no Cicero or other orator has so portrayed them. And that they speak these words to God and with God, this, I repeat, is the best thing of all. This gives the words double earnestness and life. Step two. This is right in your wheelhouse. Complain. Okay, let's clarify. Because if it's that in our wheelhouse, we should be suspicious. Complaining, in the biblical sense, is not venting your unrighteous anger at God. Let's be clear. God has big shoulders. 
you cannot diminish God with your words. Like, God is big and powerful. He can hear anything you have to say. And he's probably not going to become unhinged or triggered because you blew up on him. Right? Okay, this is God we're speaking about. At the same time, we all know that life and death are in the power of the tongue. You can say things to God that you ought not to say. And what you will do is only drive yourself further from God and you will make it worse. Don't believe the lie that you can spout off unrighteous anger at God, telling him about how messed up is the stuff he is doing, how much he has neglected you, how unfaithful and unjust he is, and imagine that you will feel better. You might for like a millisecond or maybe a few minutes, but then that heart that vents that at God is not the heart that responds to the gentle prodding and wooing of the Holy Spirit. You are deceived if you ma imagine you can spew vitriol at God and then respond in humility to him. The same heart cannot do those things. And it's not because God can't hear what you have to say. It's because in unrighteous anger, in the same way every married couple in our church, well, the vast majority of us, maybe some are just getting started and haven't had this experience yet, the vast majority of married couples know full well, you can say things that don't cause your spouse to immediately vaporize and disappear, but they do cause great damage. They only make it worse. So, when I say complain to God, I'm saying you pour your heart out to the Lord because he hears. You can speak to him in the darkest words that you have of your despair, of your discouragement, of your pain that sounds more like, God, I know that you are good, but this doesn't look good. God, I believe that you're loving. This doesn't feel like love. Yes, God, I know, and I believe that you work all things for good, but this seems like a terrible plan. God, I believe that your timing is perfect. I know that you're never late. I think you're late. I'm sorry, I think you're late. I know you're not late, but I think you are. God, I know I should never lose hope, but I have lost hope. God, I'm pouring my heart out to you. Where are you? This is complaining. This is what the Bible, I mean, can we not together appreciate how incredible it is that God is such a good father that he gives us words in the Psalms? More than one out of every three Psalms are words expressing what it's like to walk through forests of darkness. So in the Psalm, verse three through verse 12, is biblical complaining. Verse 5, my wounds. I love this. My wounds stink and fester. No, you didn't. You said that to God. You were praying and you said to God, my wounds stink and fester. You know that's what this is, right? Somehow God has taken the confession of David's heart and he turned it into the Bible as an example for us to walk with David, the path of lament. Pour your heart out to God. He is a refuge for us. The more honest you can be with God, the sooner you can move on to the third step, and that's to ask boldly. He says in verse 16, For I said, Only let them not rejoice over me who boast against me when my foot slips. The psalm ends, do not forsake me, O Yahweh. O oh my God, be not far from me. Make haste. I know you're not late, but hurry up. O Lord, my salvation, ask boldly. The one who is walking in step with the Spirit in a forest of darkness, who is walking the steps into the clearing of praise, is not simply asking God for relief. I know we want relief in our pain. 
I know the flesh yearns for relief. And if our hearts were speaking honestly to God, they would often say, God, I don't care how you do it. Just make it go away. Please, like make it go away yesterday. I don't care how you do it. I just can't. Please make it better. But God is a good father. He is sanctifying you. He is accomplishing his work in the world that requires means that we often find distasteful, that we don't often have the stomach for, and we would rather not participate in. But the Spirit in us invites us and says, will you participate with me in the work that I want to do? So you ask boldly, God, do what only you can do. God, bring justice where there is injustice. God, bring those who are hiding in sin. Bring those who are perpetrating evil with a malicious heart. Drag their carcasses into the light. Shame them in the light in front of all of your saints. Are you allowed to pray such a thing? The Psalms do all the time. We pray boldly for what God wants to do. God is more interested in his work in the world, bringing grace and salvation and forgiveness and healing and wholeness to a lost world. He's more interested in the maturity of his saints, the purity of his church, than he is in our comfort and ease. And I say praise him for it. In the same way that we say to a coach that expects the best from his team and he corrects them when they are flagging and failing, so we say, praise you, God, that you love us and you call out your spirit in us when we are hurting and giving up. You ask boldly. Ask boldly for God to do what no one else can do. The last step, you choose to trust him. There's a turn in the psalm in verse 13 where David says, I am like a deaf man. I do not hear like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no rebukes. I don't think that's a picture of David's despondency. Look in verse 12 where he says, those who seek my life lay snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and they meditate treachery all day long. I think this is David demonstrating what Jesus later said as blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. When Jesus is led to the cross, how does Jesus respond? Like a lamb led to the shears is silent. So the son of man did not open his mouth. The meek inherit the earth. We don't need, when we go through forests of darkness, we do not need to respond defensively when we are accused or attacked. We do not need to form our own militia to carry out what we think is justice. We need to entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. We need to humble ourselves before God. We need to believe and to practice what Jesus said. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. We choose to entrust ourselves to him because he alone has a track record that is impeccable, that is unimpeachable. He has never failed, though all else do, and we can trust him. When you walk this path, you will find that your confidence in God to do what only he can do will be rekindled. It will grow. You will find the Spirit giving you strength to persevere under the burden that God has seen fit for you to carry. There is a divine work in those in whom the Spirit dwells. Those who are apart from Jesus do not have this blessing and do not have access to this. If you live apart 
from repentance to Jesus and embracing him as the Savior, then I only put this before you as a pathway that God makes available to his children. This pathway is not available to those who do not worship the king because the Spirit does something miraculous and divine in the heart that turns first to God that is willing to bear their heart to God, that asks him boldly to do what only he can do. That heart begins to be able to trust him and to have confidence in him and then to praise him. That heart alone in any forest of darkness can praise him. And so the psalmist ends, do not forsake me, O Yahweh. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. It's significant that God's name is in all caps. I say that all the time. It's God's personal name. But Lord with only one capital, that's his title. That's his position. The one that you know is I am that I am, who has revealed to you his personal name as one of his children. He is the master of the universe. So you pour out to the one who is your maker, who is also the master. And you can praise him in the darkest forest. Lament is the divinely carved pathway through the forest of darkness into the clearings of praise. I am walking in this pathway. If you are in a dark forest, join me on this pathway. When you find yourself most assuredly in the future in a dark forest, this is is the path that God has carved out. It works because God keeps his promises. Let me pray for us and then we will close our service singing together. Father, the song comes to my mind. Uh, we trust you. We trust you. Your ways so much higher than our own. Thank you, Father, for the gift of lament that you have given to your saints. Thank you that it restores to our souls the joy that comes in being able to praise you. Father, thank you that you are worthy. The Spirit is worthy. King Jesus is worthy. Ah, God, how incredible you are that you do for us so faithfully what we can't do for ourselves. And your word gives us clearly instruction, practical instruction on what we can do when you see fit to put us in darkness so you also make a pathway to restore us to praise. God, thank you. We worship you. It is our joy and our privilege. Pray together in Jesus' name, amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.